and Mark Ward and I work for the Somerset Wildlife Trust and I'm managing a project called Somerset's Brilliant Coast which is a three-year project which is funded by the Wildlife Trust, the National Trust and the Kim Fund from um, Hinkley Sea. Um, and really the project is all about engaging with communities along the Somerset coast and trying to get local people to appreciate more the amazing coastal environment we have here. Um, from my own point of view, I'm actually a marine biologist by training, so what I love is coming to the intertidal zone. Today we're here at Marine Down, um, looking at rocky shores, looking at sand, looking at mud, so that's kind of where my own personal background and sort of passion comes in. And so I'm particularly um, enthusiastic about is working with um, a group of artists um, from Somerset, working with Contains Art in Watch It, but the artists from, uh, from all along the Somerset coast, and trying to look at that kind of interface between art and environment and environmental science, and seeing how we can use art or creative arts to help engage people with their environment. It's quite interesting to bring this work back to the shore, yeah. um, because what I've started doing, it, it, it's felt like a really, really natural development I guess in the work was to start to collect some of the mudstones that you find on certainly down towards Burner and yeah. Barrow yeah. Um, that are rolled so they're like pieces of mud that sort of are rolled and they actually look on the beach like they are hard stones yeah, when you pick I've them up they, them, yeah, yeah, they, they, they squish crumble, in their yeah. soft mud um, and I've been playing with recipes different sorts of ways of making making paints and things and started to play with this so this is all, all all of this actually is very mud and I thought it was really interesting to bring it back to the coast here today and to see to what extent it sort of had a synergy with the place you know and obviously it, you know it's going to have to a degree because it's made of the mud from this particular bit of shoreline um, um, but what I've been doing is um, playing with kind of adding pigments and things as well um, and it was actually really fascinating because this black I put literally one teaspoon um, of some Indian ink into the mudstone paint. So I got a jam jar of mudstone paint, one teaspoon full of Indian ink. And because of the particles in the mud, um, it's it's attached um, and it made the most deep, beautiful matte, velvety kind of black. Um, and what I've been doing is just taking this on a bit of a journey, really, and actually looking at kind of. The different types of mark making and the way that the viscosity of that mud paint obviously allows you to kind of hold on to and retain those marks um, but also i've sort of been concealing and revealing so this kind of blue paint around the edge here i guess in a way was the tide coming in um yeah. once it become a bit too busy and a bit too chaotic and things um, so working in layers and allowing allowing the painting and the rocks and the sea and all the relationships between the parts to talk to each other a little bit and I quite like the fact that the the painting now is is about the coast but it's off the coast mm. as well mm. at the same time yeah for me there are some patterns on here already which look a bit like the snail trails not so really limpets but there are the smaller snails there's one called a rough winkle which will come out from cracks and cracks and breaks at the high tide but what this thing about the mud which I I just find fascinating, but how like the what happens? You get this pattern of mud over the rocks, especially in the summer when it's not rough; it just lies there, and then the snails graze over it, and then the seaweed again would like do that like swishy thing, and yes. they make patterns with the fronds as they move across the mud. So yeah, the, the, the seaweed and the snails are doing a similar thing to you yes. on the rock, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is like the canvas, and then the silk is almost like your your mudstone layer on top yeah. and then their patterns on it as they just go about their, their life really as the time goes on now. But yeah. Well I've, I've almost given up on brushes um, yeah. with this mudstone paint because one of the things that I've learned is that it, it behaves so completely differently to any other paint I've ever used. Right. So it does really weird things. So this, this layer here, this is the base layer so this is just some heavyweight cartridge paper. So this, this base layer of the mud paint actually behaves reasonably predictably, a bit like ordinary paint. But then when you start to layer it up, very peculiar things start to happen. Because actually with normal paint, you layer it and it gets darker and it builds intensity. But with yeah. the mudstone, 
because it's got this kind of gray siltiness to it, actually, as it layers, it doesn't become darker. Right. It seems to become well, lighter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah, so so really interesting and curious, unpredictable kind of. So at, at, at some points, it seems to get darker, and then it sort of reaches the tipping point where there's sufficient buildup or something, and, and the particles. Um, so I've really enjoyed this as a challenge to me, as a kind of quite established painter. Um, how to work with this unpredictable material um, and I really like the fact that yes you know we've got all over this beach all over the shore we have this coating of mud we have this silt which is kind of laid across everything and then as you say it is also taken back yeah. by all these yeah, different yeah. natural processes and things as well and there are lots and lots of beautiful drawings in the sand that are made by all the creatures yeah. and yeah, because we haven't really talked, we've been looking at stuff on rocks, but we haven't really talked about the, the creatures in the mud. And I know we were looking earlier at the, the casts made by the, the lugworms here, and there's loads of lugworms all over the beach that have been easy to use to take tubes and pump all the sediment out and form little casts and stuff like that. And then also I know when we've been on this particular beach before, there's this sort of almost like coal dust, and some people know it was just it might actually be coal dust from a shipwreck. Um, uh, but, yeah. But it forms these little channels on the on the rocks as well. So again, we've got the black. Well, your your black is like the coal dust. Yes. It could be from a from a shipwreck or, or just I don't know. It could be just decaying organic matter as well. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the whole the whole idea of what's under the mud as well. I think layering seems to be coming up quite a lot for me. The more I think about this, I don't know. But the layer of the mud because if you dig down through the mud, you get too black. Just thinking, gosh, this this is this is truly fascinating. You know, I might start the next one as a completely black layer first. Yeah. We have this constant revealing. process yeah. of submerging and revealing and submerging yeah. and revealing, whether it's on a daily basis with the tides yeah. or whether it's over millennia. Yeah. And, and then us humans are like messing around on the edge trying to put the sea walls up. Yes. <laughs> stop it! Stop this! Stop this, stop this <laughs> dynamic process from happening! Yeah. How dare you, nature? You know. And uh, yeah, and I mean the sea walls behind us here. You know, they're major feats of engineering. <laughs> and I think I, I, I think actually, you know, for me, it's been really interesting. I haven't worked with mud paint before, mm. and one of the things that I felt very strongly actually with, when I very first started to work with them was that I thought, gosh, every mark I'm making, every 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 line, every every pooling of paint, it feels a like really connected to the earth. You know, it's very very grounding, metaphorically and physically as well, and and very connected. But also, it's like I, I feel like I'm having a conversation with my ancestors. Um, and it is this extraordinary thing. It's like, wow, this is kind of like painting that is millennia old as well, you know, and it's using yeah. processes and pigments and ways of making paint that, again, kind of echo. And it, it feels incredibly authentic of the place. Yeah. And it's really lovely to see mud being used, I think. It's just, um, how, do we, how do we get people engaged with mud <laughs> from an environmental point of view? Because it is so important. I mean, it's so rich in nutrients. That's why there's all the snails and the worms and everything in there, and that's why there's all the birds. That's why it's such an absolutely important area for migratory birds. It's all coming from that nutrient laden mud. Which currently are not in the work because I'm so busy trying to figure out what to do with the mud. Yeah. Um, but again, you'll obviously in my work, you know, often yeah. these rock type things um, have the bird interaction. As an artist, you're you're at the constantly balancing the needs of the artwork in order to make it into a successful work with any kind of messages you know and that's a very fine balance yeah and, and, I, and I think it is a two-way thing isn't it I think like as a scientist I really appreciate seeing through artists eyes and I think there are lots of scientists who are like that as well you know we're not it's not <laughs> either or um, but I think yeah that's that's why I think it's interesting I mean, at the moment, in the world we live in, there's all this thing, follow the science, follow the science, you have to understand the science. And this, Well, yeah, that would be great, but lots of people are not going to engage with the environment that way. There has to be other ways. And, the, and that mud, you know, yes, it's here, but it could be anywhere, and it's about tides, and it's about deposits and silts and things. Um, that's really important, because for me, the, the more it has that broad scope, 
to it as well, the more people I hope will find a point of contact and resonate with it. Yeah. And I think, again, with the ocean, for me, that's what we were saying earlier, you know, this is the Bristol Channel, but the Bristol Channel is connected to the Atlantic Ocean, which is connected to all the oceans, so automatically we are connected. And, and it's like, yeah, making Sorry. people realise that this bit of sea, this bit of ocean is part of, yeah, the, glo the global ocean, really, and that's maybe one way from the local out to the global that 